Hey everybody, this is Joshua Lewis with The Remnant Radio. Thank you so much for tuning in this week. Got a very exciting episode for you with Dr. Jack Deere. We're going to be talking about being filled with the Spirit. Probably not what you think it means. It's still coming on. It'll be a 20 second delay. Okay. M- Miller's looking at the live stream going, that's not live. Uh, so for those of you who are watching, we're time traveling to you 20 seconds behind the normal. There, there we, we are. Yeah. I can see it coming out of the corner of my eye. Uh, For those of you who are new to Remnant Radio, Remnant Radio exists for three purposes. We are here to challenge the traditions of men. We have different pastors and teachers come on from different churches and denominations on the show to challenge that tradition ultimately so that we empower you for practical ministry because the Bible says that eternal life is to know God and Jesus Christ whom he sent. So as we study theology, the scriptures, we believe it will impact and transform your day-to-day life. Michael Miller, how are you, sir? Fantastic. Tell me about your week. I told you this was coming. <laughs> uh, I went fishing with my son. Uh, he, well, he didn't really fish. He threw the fishing pole. He tried to throw it in the water. But so I caught some fish, and it was fantastic. Is he like two? Yeah, he's two. Yeah, he's not catching nothing. Yeah, no, he's, he's not <laughs> he's catching barely, He's barely holding the pole. He's just there looking cute. That's what he does. Okay, he's like so professional at cuteness. I have got to show the photos from the new studio for those of you. Before before we introduce uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Deer. Uh, These are photos from the new studio. Some of you have been following me on Facebook. These are furring strips that I tacked up into a brick wall and painted it white. I think it's pretty cool. And then I picked up a ton of this acoustic foam that's like four inches thick that I'm lining the other side. This is an inch thick. Yeah, I was just saying, it's what you have in the background here. It's real thin, but yeah, the stuff that's going in the new studios is is pretty cool. Uh, Painting the walls in there, it's going to end up looking like this, which is going to be really, really exciting. Uh, So very looking forward to that. For those of you who are watching and want to help us get into that new studio, you can help us out at therunitradio.com. You can donate there. And if you're cheap and you want to get something back for your donation, you can uh, buy a really cool T-shirt or maybe buy Michael Miller's Gifts of the Holy Spirit series, which is fun. Yeah, all the material plagiarized by our guest speaker or guest not speaker. Is he our guest? Our guest tonight. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we stole all of Jack Deere's stuff and regurgitated it for you. So if we said anything wrong, it's his fault. And on that note, <laughs> we've got Doctor Deere on the other end. Doctor, tell us a little bit about yourself and your ministry, sir. Hi, Josh. Um, well, right now I'm writing. I'm speaking at conferences. I've been a seminary professor, a pastor, church planter. Um, but for the foreseeable future, I think I'm going to spend my time. Uh, writing. And that's where I think I'm going to make the biggest impact. And then speak at conferences and all, always uh, be teaching in a local church wherever I'm living. We live in St. Louis now, and I teach in a church called Grace here. Okay, excellent. Um, uh, what was You've written a couple of books. Uh, when Wayne Grudem was on, he told us about Surprised by the Holy no, it's, how, how, I'm getting Surprised by the Power of the Holy Spirit. Surprised by the Power of the, the Holy Spirit and something about hearing God, the, the art of hearing God, right? Did I get this him? is, you need to do research before we bring well, on I'm, my mentor I'm to the sorry, show. I'm sorry, bro. Like, I, here's the thing. Timberly uh, Kelly, who uh, was, uh, she's, a, she's a big Vineyard fan. And she, she was sat underneath, um, she actually runs Generals for Cindy Jacobs, spoke very, very, very highly of Jack Deere. So I've watched more videos of Jack than I've actually read of Jack, All right. which is, I'm an auditory learner, so that's actually pretty normative for me. They, they have books on audio. I apologize. So I'm sorry. I, I used to be a professor at Dallas Seminary. I was a Hebrew professor. I also taught Greek there uh, once. And... Uh, at that time in Dallas, we were all pretty much deaf on the gifts of the Spirit. God doesn't heal anymore. Faith healers are fakes. I mean, I, I was taught that as a, a student, and I taught my students that. I even taught my students. I said, don't go to a healing meeting. That's a good place to pick up a demon. Now, I'd never been to a healing meeting, but I was authority on these, these things. So, and and uh, I actually taught my students that God did not speak except in the Scripture, that uh, now that we had the Scripture— we didn't need miracles anymore. Uh, miracles were just for uh, showing that the apostles were trustworthy teachers of doctrine. Now we've got their doctrine. Uh, the Bible gives us everything we need to know for life. So that was kind of my position. And I got I never met an intelligent person who knew the scriptures. And when I say that, I mean somebody I regarded as intelligent. Uh, that knew the scriptures, that actually believed in the gifts of the Spirit. Now, also, I was really isolated. I pretty much hang, hung out with my own kind of uh, uh, people. And, and I got challenged by a professor of psychiatry who believed in the gifts of the Spirit. And I took four months at the, end, at the beginning of 1986, 
and went through every single healing story in the New Testament. I spent four months doing this, every single demonic story, and I asked one question, God, why did you heal? And at the end of those four months, I was convinced that there were about 10 to 12 reasons why God healed, never to show the apostles were trustworthy teachers of doctrine, mm. but he healed because he had compassion on people, because he had mercy on people, to bring glory to his Father. There's like these 10 or 12 reasons which are all rooted in the eternal character of God. None of them in the historical transition from the Old Testament to the New Testament worship. So I, I began to believe in the gifts of the Spirit and started praying for the sick at my church. And, and uh, we started seeing healing immediately. Like a lady with a documented aneurysm mm -hmm. healed after one episode of prayer, one like two minute episode of prayer. My wife and I laying hands on her head on Monday night. She goes in for the second angiogram on Wednesday morning, going to have surgery on Thursday. And at, at, after the angiogram, they say, there's no aneurysm there. Mm. And, and she says, how do you explain this, doctor? He says, you, you can't explain it. This never happens. Aneurysms never go away. And that happened, well, we'd only been praying for the sick for about two months. And so that, that started in 1986. And in the, 1993, I published this book called Surprised by the Power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, uh, Zondervan actually uh, titled the book. They they uh, modeled it after C.S. Lewis' uh, book, you know, Surprised by Joy. And, um, and so that book got translated into multiple languages. It went all around the world. There was nothing like it at the time it was published. Uh, it wasn't kind of anecdotal stuff. Uh, it was, here are the theological, biblical reasons why God is healing today. And here are documented healing stories without a lot of hype or that uh, sort of thing. And it was their, their best selling, that was their best selling year. And this was their best selling book in that, that year. It was probably translated into 14 languages. Mm. And then two years later, I wrote uh, the sequel to it, which is, was called uh, Surprised by the Voice of God. Mm -hmm. So everybody wants to know, how, how do you hear God's voice? They get three questions all the time. How does God speak? How do you know it's God and, and not the devil or not your own emotions? And then how do you get him to speak to you? And so that book answered those, uh, those three questions and showed how much prophetic ministry there was in church history that's not being taught in the seminaries today. It's good. So those were my first two books, and they went all around the world, translated multiple languages. And, and now I'm rewriting those. I've just rewritten the, the first one, Surprised by the Power of the Spirit, with 70% new material, lots of new healing stories, um, and then, some, and then uh, a couple of chapters on ministering to the demonized. So I didn't have any of that stuff in the first book. Okay, so tell us, um, when, it, when it comes to some of this, you, you, were, you were telling us before you came on the show that Craig Keener actually used to sit in your class in Wayne Grudem's lectures. He has a book that's very similar to this, where he goes through documented yeah. miracles, doesn't he? Was it, was it inspired yeah. by your, your work? Is that the so assumption? We, well, I, Wayne Grudem and I, back in the, uh, in the 80s, or late 80s, were the only two professors in the Evangelical Theological Society which is all the conservative professors. We, we get together a week before uh, Thanksgiving and we give lectures. And Wayne and I were the only guys that were giving lectures on the gifts of the Spirit. And, and so we would organize our lectures in, in complementary themes. We'd do them back to back. You know, it would be standing room only in our lectures. And then you give the lecture and then for the next 25 minutes, every prof professor in the room can take their best shot at you. Mm. And, uh, and then a uh, number of young guys, Craig, was, Craig Keener was a young professor then, so he was in that group, and, and uh, Wayne and I would have uh, dinner on Friday night with a, with a bunch of these young guys that were all coming into the gifts of spirit. And, and Craig was one of those really, really smart guys who's just, he's gone on to be just stunning in his literary output, amazing. His uh, book on miracles, which was published in 2011, is 1172 pages, and he sifts credible eyewitness reports of miracles all over the world. And he comes to the conclusion that there are hundreds of millions of credible hmm. eyewitness reports to miracles today. And, you know, you read a book by a cessationist and he says, well, we don't see miracles today. That's a bunch of bull. They're happening all over the world. And I mean, here's a book that demonstrates that, that the uh, bibliography is 165 pages of fine print. Hmm. I mean, the guy's amazing how he can hold all this stuff in his in his mind and uh, and do it so quickly. 
Yeah, yeah, he's got he's got some very very impressive recall. Uh, when we when we were um, before before we get into all that stuff, let's let's talk about our our interview today about being filled with the Spirit. This is a common term that is being used, and I want to be very charitable to those who are listening. Most of our audience is probably going to be of the persuasion that filled with the Spirit um, is a subsequent. Uh, act of speaking in tongues. When you speak in tongues, you've they been associate filled the with the two Spirit. together. They're the two are one thing. Uh, I would say with the majority of our audience, not to say that that is the case, but I wanted to give you the opportunity to bring your perspective to the table because I feel like, uh, as I've been talking to Miller, he's he's actually been chipping away at my theology here bit by bit, trying to convince me of this. So so I, I'm going to give you the chance to to lay that axe at the root and really just cut this bad theology out of my life. Um, uh, and then on to you, sir. <laughs> okay. Um, so he, here's the, the root of the problem. That, and it's been going on for as long as we've, we've had theology in the church. People are looking for an easy way to uh, live the Christian life, for some kind of empowering or something that's sort of removes a lot of the struggle and just makes this uh, easy. So when I was at Dallas Seminary, we said the, the key is being filled with the Spirit. And, and what that meant was if you're, it meant you're empowered by the Spirit, and uh, if you're empowered by the Spirit, you're, you're being controlled by the Spirit, and you get that way by, um, uh, by simply praying to be filled with, with the Spirit, and then, you're, then pretty much the Spirit's controlling you, just like in that Ephesians 5.28, that was the passage we used, I mean 5.18, uh, you know, where it he says, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, if you're drunk with wine, you're controlled by wine. If you're filled with the Spirit, you're controlled by the Spirit. And, and so we want to be confess all your sin up to the minute. And once you do that, you're filled with the Spirit. That was the founder's view, the founder of Dallas Seminary. That was his view. You know, the problem with that view is, if you're really controlled by the Spirit, then how do you ever sin again? Right? So you have to say, well, it's relative control. Well, how relative? Well, nobody knows. So it ends up being a just a, a, a just totally disserviceable view. Um, and so you read the literature today, conservative evangelicals just throw out filled by the Spirit. And it just basically means anything. Uh, in, the, in the Pentecostal charismatic world, it means that you uh, have an experience, uh, a one-time experience where the Holy Spirit comes on you. Often it's equated with being baptized by the Spirit. Those two things are used interchangeably. Now you're empowered by the Spirit, and you can you have more power in your prayers. You have more joy. You have more power in your uh, service, and uh, that's typically w- what it means in a, in the Pentecostal world. Would, right? Would that be considered neo Pentecostalism? The idea that the tongue not tongues, but the the filling of the Spirit or the baptism of the Spirit those interchangeable words are kind of the fix all to Christianity. Well, I'm, I'm actually reading it in current Pentecostal literature. I'm actually reading that in a recent book I read. They, they just use those interchangeably. Okay. Um, but they're the same thing. That It's about em- empowering to live the Christian life uh, at a higher level of power. So your prayers get answered more, you're more loving, um, that sort of thing. It's so Christianity 2.0. But Jack, yeah. you, don't, you don't agree with either of those positions. No, I don't. <laughs> so give us... In fact... You, the, the, the whole kind of the purpose of this is, the, the, or the theology is, that the longer we live the Christian life, the easier it gets because we've learned more about, uh, about the Lord and about the power of the Spirit and that sort of thing. But if you look at the Lord Jesus' life, the hardest part came at the end. Paul, the hardest part comes at the end. He's deserted by everybody. He's waiting to, to have his head cut off. You know, it's, just, it's like the, the reward for overcoming a trial is to get a bigger one. The way the way we bring honor to Jesus is by overcoming. It's not by coasting through uh, uh, life. Uh, so I don't think you're, we're ever going to get the struggles removed in this life. The honor comes from overcoming, uh, overcoming really big uh, obstacles. So here's the problem: nobody is isolating, filled with the Spirit. They're not isolating that one expression in Greek and then looking up every single reference. So. Uh, it, it gets mixed up with the Spirit coming on, um, people receiving the Spirit in Acts and speaking in tongues. Uh, it, gets mix, it, it gets mixed up with uh, baptism uh, uh, by the Spirit. Uh, but the Spirit is not the baptizer, right? John, John the Baptist said, Jesus will baptize you with the Spirit. The baptizer, it's always been Jesus, never the Holy Spirit. 
So there's this, there's one passage that's been mistranslated, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, says in the NIV, we're all baptized by one spirit into one body. But that's not the normal way to say by one spirit. Uh, the ESV gets it right. We're all baptized in one spirit. So Jesus baptizes us in the spirit. That puts us in the body of Christ. But what you have to do at the very first is say, okay, I'm just going to look at all the references that say filled with the spirit. I'm going to keep baptism with the spirit separate. I'm going to keep spirit coming on separate. Uh, they may all be the same thing, but we don't know that. So at, at the beginning, let's keep everything separate and we'll make up And uh, every use of being filled with the spirit. We'll write down what it is. Okay. So that's the way you do it. And it turns out that there's only uh, one person who uses filled with the spirit and it's Luke three times in the gospel, five times in acts. And he uses a particular Greek word and only one Greek word for it, uh, for the word uh, filled. It's pimplemi, P-I-M-P-L-E-M-I, one word. That's, that's it. That's the only word. He makes a technical term out of it. Paul will talk about being filled with the Spirit in Ephesians 5, but he uses a different word. He uses plerao, and he's not even talking about the same experience Luke is. So, so are you with me so yeah, far? Yeah, absolutely. In Luke's writings, there are, there are eight references to being filled with the Spirit. Three in the Gospel and five in Acts. And he uses one verb to do this, complaining. There's another expression, full of the Spirit, that only Luke uses. Nobody else uses it. Luke's got it in his Gospel, and he's got it in the book of Acts. Okay? That might be the same thing. It might not. But but. We can't mix them up. We keep them separate and then, and make our notes on each one, and then we'll compare them at the end, okay? Deal. So where's the first reference to being filled with the Spirit? It's in Luke chapter 1, and it's when Gabriel comes down, and uh, he, he says to Zechariah, um, first of all, he, it, this is in verse 13, but the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. So this barren couple, past all hope of having a children, an an angel who's going to turn out to be Gabriel, comes down and says, God's heard your prayer. You're going to have a son. And then he says this. He will be a joy, and this is verse verse 14 of chapter 1. He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. What in the world could that mean? In the womb of his mother, he's going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. What in the world does that mean? This never happened before. He doesn't explain it. He just tells him it's going to happen. And uh, he says, Many people of Israel will he bring back to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteousness to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. He says, Zechariah, you're not going to have just any son. You're going to have the forerunner of the Messiah, the only prophets all the other prophets have prophesied about. He's the voice in the wilderness of Isaiah 40, calling out, make ready for the way of the Lord. So that's the first reference to being filled with the Spirit, but he doesn't explain it. And then Zechariah makes a huge mistake. In verse 18, Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man, and my wife is well along in years. So there's the most power, one of the most powerful angels in heaven standing before him, gives him this word, and Zechariah, Zechariah goes, hey, how can I be sure this is going to happen? Um, so the angel answered, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. I mean, to be in the presence of God, only the most powerful angels can be in the presence of God. He goes, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And I came all the way, I left the presence of God and came all the way here to bring this good news to you. And you didn't take it as good news. So you're not going to be able to speak until the baby's born. So uh, uh, Zechariah becomes dumb immediately, which is a, a great lesson. If, if uh, an angel ever comes to you with that kind of news, don't give him a lesson in biology. Just say thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, but now he can't speak, all right? Uh, then Gabriel, you know who he comes to next, right? He comes to Mary. 
and he tells Mary that she's going to have the Messiah. And Mary has a different response. She actually believes, uh, believes him. So, and then the, and Gabriel says, your cousin, uh, Elizabeth, who was barren, is now in her sixth month. And, and, and immediately, um, uh, Mary runs up to the hill country to visit, uh, 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 to visit uh, Elizabeth. And here's what happens. This is in verse, it's still in Luke 1. This is verse 39. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Hmm. Okay? Uh, it, it says, In a loud voice she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? And as soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. So the baby, she, now she's filled with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And she says, uh, she says to uh, uh, Mary, how is it that the mother of my Lord should come to me? How did she even know she was pregnant? How did she know the Lord was in her womb? I mean, how, how did Elizabeth know the the Lord was in Mary's womb? I, I I think that John is possibly the greatest evangelist, leading people to the Lord as a fetus. I mean, that's pretty impressive. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I I outside of the Spirit of the Lord coming upon her, and I mean, and I use I'm using this verbiage. Interchangeably, filling her interchangeably, which uh, he's trying to get us to avoid doing. He's trying to have me. <laughs> there's, there's some kind of experiential. I mean, she's not speaking in tongues. I'm, I'm assuming that's, that's what you're, you're not getting at. Uh, there, there's something yep. that, that she's experienced. No, the, the only way she knows is she's filled by the Spirit. Yeah. So that's is the it, only way she knows. So to be filled by the Spirit right here is to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to, to recognize the Messiah. So that Jesus is the Messiah. So filled with the Spirit is a salvific, a, sal a salvation-based experience. Like when I'm filled with the Spirit, I I trust in Christ. I, I would I wouldn't use that kind of terminology. I wouldn't use salvation. Th these people are saved. See, so just just look at exactly what's happened here. Mm -hmm. They're they're all, they're Mary's a believer. Uh, Elizabeth is a believer. Zechariah is a believer. So they are being. Uh, Elizabeth is given power to recognize the Lord Jesus Christ is in Mary's womb. Mm -hmm. How is it the mother of my Lord should visit uh, me? And then, the, but the, the totally stunning thing is that the baby in Elizabeth's womb leaps for joy. Hmm. He wasn't just kicking. It wasn't a birth pain. He is overjoyed. How could that be? How could a baby in the womb leap for joy? And he and she says, uh, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb. She, she said, uh, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. As soon as John heard Mary's greeting, he leaped for joy because his cousin, the Messiah, had just come into the room. What does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? Not empowered to live the Christian life, but empowered to give supernatural testimony of Jesus. Actually, this in this case, hmm. to supernaturally recognize him. That's the only way you can recognize him in the womb is by the power of the Spirit. So you're saying this is this is not a salvation moment. This is a they're saved. It's, it's a saved. revelatory this moment. Is, this is a revelatory moment of revelatory confession. Moment, yeah. So yeah. so it is it's a it's a supernatural proclamation of the Messiah's arrival of, of who he is. He's of there. who he is yeah, of his nature. Yeah, it's Jesus. It's the baby in the womb. He's the um, he's the Messiah. So it's a prophet. It's a supernatural prophetic empowerment to recognize the Son of God. See, I, I know and to, this, and to give testimony to him. 
I know this content from Jack because I got to hear him teach us in, in church several occasions. Um, but there are several other citations that you have for this. This is not the, the only occurrence. It's the first time we actually see it happen. Um, the, the earlier in Luke, we, in Luke 1, you mentioned it's, it's going to happen. Now we see it happen for the first time, but then it's going to happen again um, in Luke and then in Acts. Is that, yeah, right. I want, and I want to make so, sure we so, get to some of those as well. Yeah, so, so we have it prophesied in verse 15 that the baby is going to be filled with the Spirit in the womb, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, so we know that's going to happen. Now we know what it is because the baby leaps for joy in the womb as soon as he hears the greeting of Mary to Elizabeth. Mm-hmm. He's filled with the Spirit in the womb, mm-hmm. which means he supernaturally, by the power of the Spirit, recognized the Messiah, recognized the baby in Mary's womb is the Messiah. So, so no fasting for 40 days, no tearing in your prayer closet, just sovereignly happens. You tell me. I mean, I mean, I don't think the fetus. I mean, I keep. <laughs> I know that's offensive language for some people. You, should, you know, uh, I, would ban- I would banish the word fetus from my vocabulary. Yeah, that's when, a, I, when a I baby when I when I say that, I only mean the size of development of a human being. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, I'm a, I'm an adult. I have a toddler. I have a teenager, and I have you know, if if my wife was pregnant, I only mean that to, not to say that it's any less human than any other person, uh, but to say that it's just the size of development of a but human the, being. That's what our enemy. That's that's the word our enemies use to to discount that being a baby. It has it has been yes sir. Um, uh, but but in, in in saying so, so we we have uh, John the Baptist leaps in the womb proclamation. Mary uh, Mary Elizabeth is also filled and makes a supernatural proclamation. Uh, same thing. Same kind of thing. My, my, the, how is it the mother of my Lord should visit me? How does she know that that's the mother of uh, the Lord? She only knows it by the filling of the Spirit. Right, right. So, so what's what's our next? Is 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 Christ ever filled with the Spirit? Uh, what's what's our next? Um, uh, next one is uh, so so. Uh, fast forward to the birth of John. Okay, mm-hmm. this is in uh, Luke uh, in Luke one. Um, they come to, uh, so the rest of Luke 1, they come to, uh, Zechariah still can't talk. So they come to Elizabeth and they say, what's the baby's name? And she goes, John. And they go, that's ridiculous. He's going to be named after his father, Zechariah. So then uh, they ask Zechariah and he asks for a tablet and he writes, his name is John. And, uh, it, and then here's what happens after he writes his name is John. Verse 67, all right? Mm-hmm. His father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. Prophesies. Yeah. It's and, and he gives, gives this beautiful prophecy of the Messiah and the role his son is going to have in, in introducing uh, the Messiah and his kingdom. So, again, no speaking in tongues, no tearing in a prayer closet for this thing to happen. Sovereignly well, done about, by God. It's, yeah, it's not about power for living the Christian life, it's supernatural power to recognize the Son of God and to give prophetic testimony to him. Okay. So we have we have Elizabeth, we have uh, John the Baptist, we have um, Zechariah. We've got a family filled those, with the those Spirit. Three, those, those three, all filled with the Holy Spirit, Okay, all giving prophetic testimony to Jesus as the Son of God. So that's There's the, no other explanation. That's the three in Luke, and you say we have five in the book yeah, of yeah. Acts as well. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So th- the point is, there, it just doesn't have anything to do with speaking in tongues. It doesn't have anything to do with power for living the Christian life or any of that stuff. It's one simple thing, empowered to give supernatural prophetic testimony that Jesus is the Christ. Okay. And by the way, that's the only way anyone ever recognizes him. They only recognize him by the power of the Spirit. Is this, is this, would this be in line with what, what Christ said, wait in the upper room until you receive power to be my witnesses in Judea, Sumeria, and to the other ends of the earth? I'm, I'm sorry that you're coming out, that came out kind of muffled. The, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the text in Acts, I believe it's 1-8, where he says, wait in the upper room, you get power to be my witnesses to Judea, Sumeria, so forth and so on. So when he, when he declares you're going to receive power to be my witnesses, is that the same as the filling, which is the, the declaration of Christ that is to come? Or the, his identity as, as Messiah? or uh, he, he's, here, Here's the problem with the Acts material. He also says, I think in 1-5, you're going to be baptized with the Spirit, mm-hmm. um, or in the Spirit, not baptized, 
not baptized by the Spirit, but baptized within the Spirit. He said, also says in, in 1.8, you're going to receive power. And, and so what happens when the Holy Spirit comes to the body and, and is going to indwell all believers? It starts in Acts 2, and there's like 10 or 11 things that happen. Um, all, all Christians are sealed by the Spirit, Right. Um, and that happens whenever they believe in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. Absolutely. All Christians are indwelt by the Spirit. All Christians are given gifts by the Spirit. All Christians are baptized in the Spirit. Um, all Christians receive the Holy Spirit. So there's like a, a ton of things that all happen in Acts chapter 2, but he only singles out two things in that, in that chapter, and one of them is being filled with the Spirit, and the other is speaking in tongues. And so part of what's the confusion is, is, is that you have all these things that happen, and he's only singling out two things. And so people look at Acts 2, and they think, ah, well, being filled with the Spirit means you speak in tongues, and, and then you have power in your life. And, that's, and they kind of stop there. They don't look at the rest of the references. Okay, so, so, and that's problematic because of what we just talked about. You don't see any speaking in tongues anywhere in the Luke references, and this is the same author who wrote Acts. Yeah, right, right. So the, the I guess the question would be, um, people who are reading this, they go, well, it's like the word when Paul says deacon or elder or uh, pastor. These words are just interchangeable for for leadership in a local con- a congregation. Uh, what would be yeah. the would the argumentation to well, say that filled with the Spirit, baptized with the Spirit, power that these kinds of things aren't just interchangeable language? Um, to say that because because of the way he uses it in the book of Acts. Okay. So I'll sh- so I'll show you. Um, so we've got five uses in the book of Acts, and they're all the same. Okay. Um, so in chapter two four, this is the first time it happens, and it it says, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Okay. So what but what actually are they declaring when they're they're uh, they're speaking in these other languages? It says uh, down in verse. 11, the, the last half of verse 11, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask each other, what does this mean? And, and so then Peter stands up, still filled with the Spirit, and he preaches the first sermon. Right? I mean, he's telling them what this means. He said, mm-hmm. this is what Joel prophesied. This is the coming of the Spirit. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and so he is empowered by the Spirit to give prophetic testimony to Jesus. And by the end of that message, 3,000 people come to the Lord that day. Okay. So this is whatever else that maybe speaking in tongues goes with this all the time. But whatever else it is, for sure, it's a prophetic empowering to speak now to unbelievers. And in the book of Acts, the only time anyone is filled with the Spirit is in the presence of unbelievers. And we're chewing, we're chewing, yeah, I know. we're chewing, we're thinking, we're thinking. Jack, it is always is, in the presence of unbelievers. Is there any other reference in the Gospel of Luke to this event, the filling of the Spirit, outside of just the ones no. we pulled out of Luke? No, 1? just those three. Just those three. So there's those... a reference that just there's a reference in, in Luke four one it says Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit. But we're saving all that. We're not going to mix this up yet. It may be the same thing, but we don't know that. So we're but we're gonna we're gonna go through all the pimplamy uses first. Okay, so and then we'll go back and we'll go through all the full of. We got expression. twenty minutes or twenty five minutes. So we got to keep going. Yeah, we'll, we'll probably have to highlight some of these if you want to hit all all three different versions. Okay, um, so X two, whatever else the filling of the spirit is, it's a prophetic empowering that gives supernatural testimony to Jesus. All right. Can it be accompanied so, by different signs? I mean, is, is that the assumption that that? Well, it was accompanied by speaking in tongues. There, yeah. Okay. And so, but is is that going to be? Uh, is Necessary. that going to be normal? No, it's Got the it. only time. Okay. It, 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 tongues falls away. All right. So the next one is they take uh, they take uh, Peter prisoner, and um, it and they this is in uh, four chapter four, they bring him before the Sanhedrin, and they say in um, verse seven they said they had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them, by what power or what name did you do this? And remember, Jesus says you're going to be taken before the councils, the Sanhedrin, mm-hmm. and all. He says, "Don't worry about what you're going to say. The Holy Spirit will give you utterance." 
Mm -hmm. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Once in 12, once in Luke 12, and once in Luke 21. One time he says, the Spirit will give you the utterance, and then another time he says, I will give you utterance. But that's really the same thing. He's sending the Spirit to give them utterance. All right? Mm -hmm. So this is the first example of that happening. So they got they got Peter up here. They think he's just a dumb fisherman. You know, they think they can intimidate him. They go, well, by what name did you heal this guy? Where did you do this miracle? And here's what Peter says in, in verse 8. Um, then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple and are asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. He is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the capstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no one under, another name under heaven given to men by, uh, by which we must be saved. So what does that mean? He's filled with the Spirit. What does he do? Hmm. He gives supernatural prophetic testimony to Jesus as the Messiah in the face of a hostile audience. And I think it's probably important to note that he had already been filled with the Spirit, and he's being filled with the Spirit. So if, if filled with the Spirit is a sign of the Holy Spirit's indwelling for supernatural miracles, why is he being filled again? If the, Now you're thinking that's exactly how you should be thinking. This is a second filling. Mm -hmm. This is not the first filling. Some people go, go no, what he means is, uh, and Peter, who had been filled with the Holy Spirit, and still filled with the Holy because if he wanted to say that, there's a way to say that in Greek, and you use the pluperfect tense. They don't use the pluperfect tense here. They use a simple past tense, hmm. which means he's being filled a second time. Mm -hmm. So what does that tell you? That the filling of the Holy Spirit is not this permanent thing we carry around inside us. It's a temporary empowering to give testimony to Jesus to unbelievers. So Dr. Jim Shaddix came on the program uh, last week and was talking. He's from South. Eastern Theological Seminary. I don't know. It's one of those Southern Baptist seminaries, and it's got a Southwestern, Southeastern or something in it. Uh, they all have South in them. Yeah. Whatever. Uh, he came on the program, and he discussed how the unction, the anointing comes upon preachers. He was trying to put verbiage to what was happening in the book of Acts, and it sounds like exactly what you're talking about, that it is yeah. something of, of Christ filling you for a supernatural proclamation. Yeah, I wouldn't say anointing. I wouldn't say... Uh Coming him on, your, I would just say your, what Luke says. He was then. he was he was Southern Baptist. He was hunting for a word. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah, he yeah. was. I'm just trying to help. It, it, yeah, it is so simple. Yeah. So all you have to do is take out a concordance and look up "fill with the Holy Spirit," mm -hmm. and 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 then just say what it is each time. So here he's. It, it shows us it's a repeatable empowering. Okay. Okay. It comes. It empowers you when you need it. When do you need it? When you're standing before unbelievers and you want to give testimony to Jesus, hmm. now Jack, that's when you need it. You All made right? you made All mention right. in uh, Luke twelve eleven and twelve when uh, Jesus says, "Don't worry about when you're brought yeah. before the courts. Uh, yeah. Don't worry about what you're going to say. Don't plan ahead. That the Holy Spirit will give you what you need in that moment." Yeah. And you're saying that now we're actually seeing the first fulfillment of first fulfillment of that. Yeah. And so, would you say that Luke eleven or Luke twelve eleven and twelve is a a uh, reference to the filling of the Spirit? Yeah, but he doesn't use it there. He doesn't I mean, use the term. That's exactly. We have to wait to find out that that's that's how that verse is going to be fulfilled. Okay. Okay. So now, no more references until you get to uh, Acts chapter nine. So. Um, And this is uh, Stephen, right? Has his camera or, froze? He's remarkably still right now. Oh, yeah, his <laughs> camera froze. Do we need to redial, or how do we do this? Uh, we'll probably just... Um, it's not saying bad connection. We'll wait for it to kick back up. While, uh, go ahead and read that verse if you have it pulled up while we try to get him uh, tuned back in. Let me see if I can find the verse. I'm not sure which one it is. Let's see if I can get this to respond while you're doing that. Boom. Well, I can just say this while we're waiting. If you're, uh, whoa, oh, there we oh, go. Sorry. No, it's okay. I, I lost you guys. No, yeah. It's okay. Did you get a call or something on the phone? 
No, no, I didn't get a call. Oh, uh, I'm, I'm not on the phone. I'm on my computer. So oh, there you I, go. I, so, the, so the next reference is at the end of chapter four. <laughs> got right? it. Okay. So uh, they, they, uh, Peter and and uh, John come back and uh, give a report, and they break out into a prayer meeting, and then here's the, here's the last here's the end of the prayer meeting. This is verse twenty nine. Chapter 4, verse 29. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And that is a great apostolic prayer, to pray for signs and wonders. That is apostolic, to pray mm -hmm. for that. But they're not just praying for signs and wonders. They're actually praying for boldness to, to speak to, uh, in the name of Jesus. So verse 31. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the Word of God boldly. Hmm. Something I noticed there is uh, if they were already filled, and, and, and that was if that was as others define it, as an empowering in the Christian life, why would they have need to pray for God to perform miracles if they've already got the power to perform the miracles? No, it's a, t it's a temporary empowering. The that, Spirit just comes on them. That's what I mean. They, yeah. Yeah, there would be no reason to pray for God to extend his hand to heal if they already had it. If oh, right, right. That's what you're saying. Yeah, 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 right. So, and, and actually, you know, they're not even, they're not praying to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I mean, they're, they're praying to speak the word of God boldly. Okay, when you say boldly, guys, what do you mean? Well, you know, we mean with signs and wonders, that, that sort of thing. And God says, okay, in that case, I'll fill you with my spirit. Hmm. Filling of the Spirit is empowering to give supernatural testimony to Jesus, and they're in the faith. They've just come from unbelievers. They're surrounded by unbelievers, and so he, it says uh, the place where they were meeting was shaken. He actually shook the house. A sign that he's going to answer that prayer, and by answering that prayer, he's going to shake the world. Hmm. And this is now the third so, time that this has happened to Peter. Yes, third time, yeah, for Peter. And, and whoever else, however many of these guys, we don't know who all these guys are in this prayer meeting, but, you know, some of them were probably in the first prayer meeting in, in Chapter 2, and so it'll be, they'll be filled again. By the way, they, uh, on the Isle of Hebrides in 1949, Duncan Campbell led a great revival. You know about that revival? I, I am familiar with Duncan Campbell, yes, sir. It's one of the most famous revivals, and, and you know how it began? They were in a granite house praying for the, the youth on that deal. Duncan Campbell was in there. And God shook the granite house, wave after wave of his power, and then they broke out into this incredible revival. It was like a, a little repeat of this. Hmm. So now we got three references to fill with the Spirit in, in the book of Acts, all in the presence of unbelievers uh, and all giving supernatural testimony to Jesus. And the next one is hey. Acts chapter 9. Yeah, and they don't speak in tongues here. It's not generalized power for living the Christian life. It's not baptism in the Spirit. Um, it's simply prophetic empowering the testament yeah so the next one's acts nine all right so paul, paul is now led back uh in, into damascus and um ananias comes to him in verse 17 this is acts 9 17 then ananias went to the house and entered it placing his hands on saul he said brother saul the lord jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So he prays for him. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's thighs, and he could see again. He got he got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. Now it doesn't it doesn't say that he was filled with the Spirit here. It doesn't it doesn't tell us. It just says this was the purpose of him coming, so he would be filled with the Spirit. It was a prophesy, much like John the Baptist's prophecy that he would be filled with the spirit well, so then you read you read and see what the very next thing he does it says in uh in the next part of verse 17 saul spent several days with the disciples in damascus at once he began to preach in the synagogues that jesus is the son of god all those who heard him were astonished and asked how isn't he the man who raised havoc in jerusalem uh, among those who call on the name and hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priest? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ. Hmm. So it, it, it gives us the implicit evidence of what it means to be filled with the Spirit. He's proving that Jesus is the Christ. He's doing it supernaturally. They're baffled, and, and so much so that they decide to kill him, and he has to be led out of Damascus at night. 
over a wall in a basket. That's he's not speaking in tongues. No tongues. He, he's with unbelievers, and he's proving that Jesus is the Christ. Now, one last reference. It's in uh, Acts uh, 13. Um, he's Paul and Barnabas are witnessing to the uh, Sergius Paulus, the governor uh, of, of the island. And uh, it says in verse 8, this is Acts 13, verse 8. Um, but Elamas, the sorcerer, uh, excuse my box there. But Elamas, the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elamas and said, you are a child of the devil, an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You're going to be blind, and for a time you will be unable to see the light of the sun. Immediately mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about, seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. Hmm. So, so unilaterally, we have one account where uh, filled with the Spirit was accompanied by tongues, but the word yep. baptism is also used there. Uh, but we, we see... No, no, it's not used in it's, Acts 2. It's not used in Acts 2. It's used in Acts no. 1. It's used in it's Acts, Acts 1. 1. So, so Jesus is saying, you know, not many days from now, you're going to be baptized uh, in the Spirit. And then he says, and power is going to come upon you, so you'll be witnesses. You, you can't be my witnesses without power. Mm-hmm. Um, and that reference can certainly includes the filling of the Spirit, but it can include, you know, just like gifts of healing are going to be given and that that uh, sort of thing. So um, maybe for the sake of time, because we've we've it's uh, we've already been 46 minutes into the program, so we only got about 15, 14 minutes left. Maybe we can talk about what baptism of the Spirit means, and we can let people look that content up so that you can kind of source that for them, so that so that they can understand how how, yeah. how you understand so, those verses. So baptism in the Spirit is the simplest uh, simplest thing. Um, it, in First Corinthians twelve thirteen, Paul says, "For we are all baptized." Uh, in one spirit into the bo- into one body. Mm-hmm. But we are all carnal Christians, uh, spiritual Christians, all Christians are baptized uh, in one spirit, immersed in one spirit into the body of Christ. All Christians. There's not, there's not like some. Uh, and, and so you might, you know, some people will say, well, there are two kinds of baptisms. You know, like they'll say, there are two kinds of tongues. Well, that's sort of just making up stuff. Um uh, you know, because it didn't fit your theology. Right, so so there's the, you, you're not denying like a baptism in water and a baptism in the Spirit. You're, you're saying there's... Well, you can be baptized by water and not even be a believer. Right, absolutely true. No, he, he's, he's talking about, uh, 1 Corinthians twelve thirteen. he's talking about uh, being baptized... In the spirit. Um, well, when you when you said two different baptisms, you were probably referencing the bab- baptism oh, of the mean, spirit. No, no, I mean, I mean, somebody could say, "We'll say, like they do with tongues." You say, uh, "What Paul says, not all speak in tongues, do they?" And mm-hmm. the answer is no. It's the same passage where he says, "All aren't apostles, are they?" And the answer to each one of those questions is no. So you you say that to uh, Pentecostals, and they'll say, "Well, yeah, he's talking about the public gift of tongues, right?" Uh, not all have that but there's a private one that all of us can have that's Some, that's the only reason i brought that up was because yeah. you're not denying like a water baptism you're saying that there's no, no, no. There, it's no, not I'm you're not multiple not two, they're not two kinds of being baptized in the spirit right there's only one and that's what places us in the body of christ Excellent. and it happens to every single christian so we have um filled with the spirit which means yep. proclamation of the gospel oftentimes in front of a hostile audience if not yeah universally in front of a hostile audience. We have uh, baptism uh, in the Spirit. From Acts 4, well, you know, the audience in Acts 2, that was the audience that killed Jesus, right? Absolutely. So every they audience in like, Acts. Yeah, I wouldn't call them friendly. Yeah. Uh, but, from, but from Acts 4 on, it's really hostile. I mean, yeah. they're calling them, putting them on trial, uh, and then pretty soon they want to kill them. They don't want to just put them on trial. Okay, so so yeah, it's all, always, always uh, uh, in the presence of unbelievers. It, it's never... And empowering to live the Christian life. Well, that's so. That's the use in Acts, right? But so, like the use in yeah. Luke. I mean, obviously, 
it those aren't hostile like, audiences like you know no 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 it, 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 it was there it was to give super it was the initial supernatural testimony to uh the infant jesus okay uh to john uh, and john is his um uh, is his forerunner and i think you could probably say with with very very much confidence that proclaiming that in a different audience could get you killed so i think it takes quite a bit of bravery to declare that this this child is the christ um, yeah, yeah. So, so, so we can we can maybe wiggle with that one as well. So, as as we look at these filled with the Spirit, hostile audience pro- proclamation of who Christ is, uh, baptism of the Spirit is baptized into the body of believers. And there's another one that we haven't discussed uh, that I'd like to, if we just have a little bit more time, uh, is is full of the Spirit. That's a that's okay. a third reference. Is that correct? Yeah. Let Let's try. Yeah, and and by the way, this is only in Luke and Acts. Luke is the only one who does uh, full of the Spirit. So if you turn to Acts 6, this is like a real clear example. It's going to turn out that full of the Spirit is a more flexible term Mm -hmm. than filled with the Spirit. Um, Okay, so... uh, the, there's, this is the first threatened split in the body of Christ. The Greek widows aren't getting their fair share of the food. And, and so the apostles, here's what the apostles say. Ver, this is Acts 6, verse 3. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the Word. Okay, so let's go full of wisdom. What does that mean? Have lots of wisdom. I yeah, mean, or we would say, if you say lots of wisdom, you'd say very wise person, mm-hmm. right? So to be full of is like a character description. It, it's not necessarily empowered by wisdom hmm. um, or led by wisdom. It's you. You're a very wise person, and uh, so to be full of the Spirit, just by analogy, would mean you're characterized by the Spirit. You're a spiritual person, which n- number one would be. You're, we're characterized by the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, patience, which is exactly what these guys would need to resolve this controversy. So do you think when Paul says, you know, walk in the Spirit and you won't gratify the lust of the flesh, do you think the walk in the Spirit would be a similar kind of as being full of the even, Spirit? See, I wouldn't even be thinking in Paul right now. Yeah. I'm, I wouldn't, that's a whole other discussion, what walk in the Spirit means. Uh, or what Romans 8 led by the Spirit. It's a whole other discussion. And if you start introducing that stuff at this stage, you're just going to get confusion. So mm-hmm. first, we're gonna, you need to look at every reference of full of the Spirit and decide what that means in Luke. And then we'll say, okay, does anybody else talk like this? Is there, or does Paul have a, is Paul talking about the same concept, but does he use a different word? But you can't skip around in this stage. In, in the beginning stage, you stay with one thing. You make notes on each passage. Uh, and then decide what it means at the end, and then we'll go on to whatever. So what you're doing right now, and this is something I've always appreciated about you, um, you're not just teaching us what a particular term means and giving us content, you're also teaching us how to learn, how to study, in the very same, with this as the example. Yeah, this is exactly how you do theology. You you, you don't do a scattergun approach. Um, One one of my skills, one of my... uh, 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 things I, that I specialized in is lexicography, saying what words mean in different languages, especially in dead languages. And this is how you do it. You don't skip around. You stay and look up all the references to one word. And in theology, you just you look up all the references just like we're doing uh, right now. And, and uh, so that's the f- first thing we notice that full of <clears throat> is probably at least sometimes a character description, because that's what it is when you pair it with full of wisdom, you're talking about a person's character. Okay, excellent. So, right. yeah, yeah, and, and the, the, the reason I bring those up is because as we're, as we're discussing this, those are the things that come to mind, is to think of, okay, well, if these are descriptions of individuals, where do we see these descriptions? And my mind races to those places. Um, so this, this form of uh, study. What would you What would you call um, a, a word study? I mean, it's, it's a lexicon a lexicon based study where you just look at one Greek word every time it's used as you break I, these down. I mean, this is just like, but this is just how you do theology. Yeah. You just stay, you if you want to know what something means in the Scripture, you just study that thing and all its occurrences, and then you go to another subject, and then you compare the subjects. Um, so, if, if we were going to study the Holy Spirit, we would say, okay, let's look at all the references of fill with the Spirit. 
Let's look at all the references of being received, of the Spirit being received. Let's look at all the references of the Spirit coming on somebody. Let's look at all the references of, of uh, being indwelt, of being baptized. When we just look at all of those things and write down what each of them are and see if there's kind of overlap here or what, or do they overlap with something in Paul where, where he's not even calling it the Spirit, but it's something that he's attributing to Christ, but it looks like it's uh, also a work of the Spirit. But you got to start with the individual, stay with one class, one individual class. Excellent. Um, Jack, for, we're, we're about to run out of time here, so I wanted to ask you a, a practical question on this, because a lot of viewers are going to hear this, and they're going to go, well, what do you call what happened to me? Um, what do you call what? They're going to say, well, what do you call what happened to me? Somebody laid hands on me, oh, and yeah. I started okay. speaking in yeah. tongues. So, so first off, let me just, I'm so glad you asked that. I am not denying the reality of anyone's experience. I know there are people who, who pray and they struggle, uh, and, and the Holy Spirit comes on them. They speak in tongues, and they go through a, a really uh, transforming process. I, I totally buy that. I, I, I buy into that. I'm, I'm, just, I'm not denying that that's a reality, that it happens all the time, or that speaking in tongues is, is really valuable, and it's a uh, super uh, form of prayer. I'm not denying any of that. I'm just saying it's not what Luke means when he says be filled by the Spirit. That's be filled with the Spirit is an evangelistic work, and it's exclusively evangelistic. Mm. But he's got other uses of, of the Spirit, too. So it's not it's not like, I mean, speaking in tongues is real. It happens, and the Spirit comes on people and uh, it, it, all that. So, but that's not what filled with the Spirit. So I'm just disputing that. Uh, that trying to make something, uh, make fill the spirit be something it's not, and then so. So here's an, a follow up question to that: Have you been? A, have you had an experience where you were filled with the spirit? Yes, oh, a bunch of times. Can you give first us one? A, I tell, okay, I'll, I'll tell you the first one. All right. So, I, and I don't even know what it is. I, I'm a I'm a senior in college. I am totally sold out to evangelism. I'm leading tons of kids to the Lord. I'm a young life leader. My club's got 250 kids in it on Monday nights. And I'm bringing home a group of uh, kids from a ski ski, tramp, a ski camp. It's Christmas time. And we're taking over the plane. Uh, uh, we're, we're coming in from Colorado. They're singing rowdy songs and all that. And I'm sitting next to a girl who's a junior at a, col in high, at a college in, in uh, Colorado. She's coming back to Dallas for Christmas. She's not a believer. Um, she's unhappy. Uh, she, she doesn't even know if there's a God or not. And um, so I think, ah, that's why God put me here. I'm, so I'm going to lead her to the Lord. And she tells me her favorite book is by Abraham Maslow, Toward a Psychology of Being. I read that book in philosophy that, that, that semester and criticized it, knew everything is wrong with it. So I think this is going to be so easy. And uh, 90 minutes later, I am so frustrated I want to change seats. She uh, has not been able to understand one single explanation I gave her doesn't understand what I mean when I talk about the cross. Um, and I'm, tick, I'm actually ticked at her. And now the plane is starting to land. We're, we're going down into Love Field, old Love Field in Dallas. And the a pilot comes on the phone or on the microphone. And he says, uh, there's a snowstorm here. We're going to have to circle uh, Love Field probably for about 45 minutes. And I think, ah, oh, I've been given a reprieve. And so here's what I do. I, I do the thing that I've avoided doing the whole hour and a half conversation. I pray. I say, Lord, would you would you help me? Uh, would you help me lead her to the Lord? Would you help me give a testimony to her? And uh, and then this sentence forms in my this sentence forms in my mind. And I look at her and I say, You know what your problem is? And she goes, No. I said, It's the same as mine. You're a sinner and you need a savior. And she bawls and she goes, I know it's true. It's true. Dang. Right there on the plane. Praise God. I mean, an hour and a half of apologetics. That's my specialty, by the way, giving reasons for God's existence and why the scriptures are true. And I, don't, I get no place. I said, Lord, would you please uh, help, help me testify to her, help me to witness to her? And all of a sudden, this sentence just popped, at least three sentences popped into my mind. You're a sinner. You know what you promised? You're a sinner and you need a savior. Your promise is the same as mine. Hmm. And that was the, that was the door that, that uh, opened her heart. Um, I was filled with the Spirit. I didn't know that at the time because I didn't know what filled with the Spirit was. But I was empowered to give testimony to Jesus, and it was in those uh, those little sentences. So I uh, I think I found the key to evangelism now. You know what your problem is? You're a sinner. You need a Savior. 
next person I try it to goes, I'm not a saver, you self-righteous know, I'm not a sinner, you self-righteous know it all. <laughs> I try it five or six more times, but it was, a, it, it was a temporary empowering of the spirit came on me to witness and then lift it off when I didn't need it anymore. It's interesting. And I, I've, I've had that experience. I've had experiences like that. Now I know what it is when I'm talking to an unbeliever or I'm standing in front of a group of unbelievers, I can feel the spirit come on me sometimes. And I'm, it's like, I'm in this zone and I see people crying, uh, see, see people stunned. Uh, yeah, it happens. It, it, when I get around unbelievers and I'm speaking to unbelievers or just conversation with unbelievers, if I'm praying for it, it'll, it'll often happen. That's intense. We'll have to we'll have to do a part two when it comes to receiving the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came upon and looking at some of those other those other words when because it's baptism very baptism of the Spirit. That's the big controversial. It's one, very I think. interesting. It, it very very well may, may be the the most controversial one. But it doesn't even sound like you're even denying these things are different. You're just saying let's be specific with the language here. Let's let's say what the Bible says and use the biblical vocabulary so that we don't kind of everyone becomes a, a what we are. Uh, anointed healing evangelist, you know, opposed to just saying evangelist, just use biblical language so we don't get things confused. See, I think it, isn't that one of the big problems of the church? We're ignoring evangelism. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's just, it's, we're in favor of pursuing some kind of, you know, powerful experience or that, that sort of thing. I, I mean, I'm all for, I want to experience God. I want to feel his affection. But man, I want to lead people to Christ. Mm. My, my problem with the charismatic expression of baptism of the Spirit has been predominantly that, that when I, even Bible school, for example, people would be speaking in tongues, people have, you know, had encounters with the Holy Spirit. I'm like, hey guys, let's, let's go do some evangelism. Let's go, you know, witness inside of these high schools. And their response is, well, I need to wait for the boldness, the baptism of boldness. Because, you know, there's, yeah. there's 16 different baptisms that you have to receive <laughs> before you can be effective Christian. Um, and I just thought, man, that, that's so sad. That, that we've we've gotten there with this um, but but if it's if the baptism of the spirit is an excuse for you not to talk about Jesus um, then it's probably yeah. poor theology I would I would I would venture to say um, but that's interesting uh, I'm, I'm gonna have to chew on this for a little bit uh, we will have to come back and dialogue some of this later uh, how, how are ways that that people can follow you read your books what was the be- what would be the best place for them to to find your content? Uh, just uh, go to my Facebook page. I'm not on it very often, but uh, sometimes I check it or someone else checks it. Excellent. And you've got, obviously, four books out that people can get right now. Yeah. Um, and I know one place they can listen to some of your sermons is from the Wellspring webpage. There's still a whole archive of sermons on there. Yeah, and I think I never I, I never listen to me, but I think I'm, I'm, there's a lot of my stuff on YouTube. People tell me that all Tons. the time. Yeah, I've, I've listened to quite a bit, hours and hours and hours. Um, you guys, check us out uh, on the website, theremnantradio.com. You can donate there if you want to help us uh, get some sweet gear for our new studio. Uh, we would love for that additional help. Uh, check us out every Monday night, 8.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. We will be interviewing tons of pastors and teachers in the coming months. You guys be blessed, and we'll see you next time.